Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and boy, oh boy, am I glad to be saying that. That's right, it's time for the Kev Baker Show, right here on Truth Frequency Radio, www.tfrlive.com. And I say I'm glad to be saying that, because it feels like so long since I've been here to speak to all of you. Yeah, I know, I was on TFR on Friday, not that long ago, but the weekend, so much can happen, so much reading can be done. So many ideas can be formulated that it's really great to get back here at the microphone to be speaking to all of you out there. And I've got a brilliant show lined up for tonight because ever since news of this black hole image that I really can't stop talking about came onto the the internet, onto the major news wires, stuff like that, the first person who actually sprung into my mind, believe it or not, You may think it was Dr. Brian Keating who we had on last week and he got in touch with me subsequently after the image and we obviously done that show, we spoke about it. But the first person I thought of was somebody who comes onto the show on a regular basis now and his name is Brendan Drackler. Now for anyone out there who doesn't know Brendan, he's an astrophysics PhD student at the Rochester Institute of Technology working to understand how we can better detect the most dense and energetic objects in our universe. Yes, you guessed it, folks, black holes, and how we can learn more about them. Now, Brendan has spoke on a range of topics, all covering subjects like our solar system, the nature of dark energy, and dark matter as well. We'll be getting into all of this stuff tonight, all the way out to supernova and many things in between. Now, more information about Brendan and his outreach efforts can be found over at his website, and it's called thestateoftheuniverse.com. That's thestateoftheuniverse, all one word, dot com. And you can also, over there, catch up with and subscribe to his podcast. I've said it every time that Brendan's on, and I mean it more each time he comes back, because I get a chance to catch a couple of shows in the meantime And I'm telling you, folks, for anyone out there like myself who has a a science kind of geeky side to them, can't recommend this fellow and this podcast highly enough. And we're really lucky that Brendan comes on here. You know, we're going to try and make it a regular occurrence because I just love to pick this guy's mind. Here he is. He's back with us. Brendan, how you doing, sir? Hey, I'm good, Kev. Thanks for having me. Hey, real quick, I'll plug something, okay? Last week on my podcast, I had Dr. Ray Weiss. Does that name ring a bell to you, Kev? No, tell me more. Okay. He won the Nobel Prize in 2017. He was the the man, the brain behind LIGO, the the gravitational wave detectors. Does that Uh, ring a bell? Yeah, because I was actually just bringing that up the other night with um, Brian Keating. Because it's a really exciting time for, for physics right now. You know, you've got all the black hole stuff going on. You've got the LIGO stuff. It's really, as Brian said, it's like a golden age that we're in here. Yes, it is. It is. And and I had the fortune to talk to the man who's been working to bring that golden age to where it's at today for, you know, decades, decades. And, de- and he's won every single prize in this field. Every prize you can win, he's won it. He's won the Nobel. He's won the fundamental prize in physics. He's won them all. And uh, so people... Go check that out. I mean, it was a really amazing interview. He was a he was a dropout. He dropped out of college, and so it's good to sort of talk to him about his progression from being a dropout. From he was an immigrant. He fled the Nazis. He went to to college at MIT. He dropped out. He has a fantastic story. So I encourage people to go check that out. But Kev, now I have something for you. Okay, I have a I have a trip planned for us. Okay. Oh, so here's good. what it is. There is a flat Earth cruise in 2020. <laughs> The Flat Earth Society is going to pile onto a cruise ship and, and and cruise on down to the ice wall that borders the Flat Earth. And I think you and I should buy some tickets, Kev. I think so. You know, it might become a bit of an echo chamber. It might just all be Flat Earthers there if we don't actually tag along. And, you know, somebody has to take some images, you know, else everyone will think they're fake anyway, Brendan, right? Yep. Yep. They're going to use their iPhones, which rely on GPS, which relies on the curved Earth to take pictures of the ice wall bordering the flat earth. Yes. Don't forget don't forget the iPhone. You know, I'm really surprised they didn't actually use this as a selling point, but there seems to be a really special filter in the camera 
It's the only filter in the world. Forget all the telescopes that are out there. Forget everything. Because this is the only thing that can capture images of Nibiru as it rises in the morning as well. So, yeah, the iPhones are amazing, dude. They truly are. <laughs> yeah. I See, Kev, I, I look at your comment section and you attract some some far out ideas you do i those people for some reason don't attract i had some guy trying to sell me on a gyroscope the other day that can move faster than the speed of light or something in my comment section but generally i don't get them but you you get all sorts of uh interesting commenters um and of course i'm not insulting your fan base 99 percent of them are wonderful people but i re read the comments sometimes and i'm like man you got some far out ideas here well, this is uh, some of the stuff we're going to be addressing as the show goes on, right? Because we're going to get into things like dark energy, dark matter. Yep. And um, the first thing that we're going to start on as well, black holes, even the black holes themselves. You know, I, I expect that any time any announcement comes from anything, whether it's science, whether it's some big event happening in the world, there's always going to be people that instantly just call shenanigans. They think everything's mm -hmm. fake. And it's really hard to really break this mindset. And we were talking about this before the show. And then um, the black holes, again, you know, definitely something that people are either, you know, 50-50 on, especially in the circles I move. So what do you think kind of gives rise to this very cynical kind of slant that people take at anything coming from science? I'm not sure. And I think a lot of it has to do with the politicalization of science, right? I mean, this is this is evident in a lot of specifically American presidencies. I can't speak to other ones because I, you know, obviously I don't know what the politics are like where you are, what the politics are like in France or you know wherever. But I know that in America, there's a history of politicizing politics um, as a way to to get. You see this happening right now with climate change. You know, like the 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 far left people have latched onto the idea of climate change, the fact that. Oh, doomsday is coming, and we only have 12 years to fix all of our problems, and and we need to act now. And th in retaliation, the far right says, mm, no, I'm not going to listen to you, not because I don't believe the science, but because you're telling you're, – you're essentially identifying with it, and I don't want to identify something that you, that you identify with. Therefore, I'm just going to pretend that climate change isn't happening. You know, And you have these spectrums of, of not just political ideas but, but just different people. You know, the different ways of thoughts, different ways of thinking, and they, they polarize themselves. And when they polarize themselves, they also latch onto ideas, and those ideas get polarized too. And so you see that happening with tons of things. I don't think it happens as much with black holes as it does with things like, you know, climate science or, geez, the flat earth that we were just talking about is getting bigger, or anti-vaxxers, um, which anti-vaxxers are exclusively 40-year-old white women. That's a statistic you can write down. OK, I think that's a fact. Forty year old white women exclusively. It's an anti-vaxxer community. <laughs> See, the, but, the old vaccinations, I think the problem comes and this is where my problem lies with them. The fact that, you know, some of the ingredients that they put in with the vaccines, you know, the science of vaccination, I've got no problem with whatsoever. But it's some of the stuff that they use. And in the past, they've used things like thimicerol and mercury to take things across the blood brain barrier now again mm -hmm. I, I never tell anyone brendan I, i'm nowhere near a doctor the closest i get to a doctor speaking to people like you sir so i mean i'm no expert but i think that's what gives rise to a lot of the kind of um, fears and of course there's this idea that vaccination could be linked to the rise of autism w what would you say to that um i'll, I'll speak quickly this is a fantastic example they we're talking about when we're talking about the way that that ideas can can um, be corrupted. So the pharmaceutical industry ruins vaccines. I would say the pharmaceutical industry is the reason we even have anti-vaxxers because they're so dirty and they're so disgraceful in the way that they operate. I don't know. Does how does healthcare work where you're at, Kev? Well, we, we're kind of um, a lot different to you. I'm left in kind of limbo sometimes speaking to my American friends because you've got this whole insurance system. You have to pay every time you go and want anything done by the doctor. But over here, it's more socialist. We get it right. kind of given to us. We pay on our, our taxes and we get the National Health Service in return. 
You'll hear good and bad stories about that, Brendan, but at least it cares for everyone. And, and again, they, they've got the same kind of vaccine regiment over here as you guys in the U.S. Right. And, um, you know, in the U.S. in particular, you have a history in the pharmaceutical industry of price gouging, of taking advantage of people. You know, historically, this has happened. Look at the opioid epidemic and its and its relationship to big pharma. It's natural to distrust big pharma, and if big pharma are the people that are creating certain vaccines, then it's reasonable to be skeptical, to be skeptical of the price you pay for them or what's in them, and that's all completely understandable. I get it. I get it, um, and I'm not sure there's a clear solution to that, but certainly my take to, to answer the question, my take is don't stop getting vaccines, at least the important ones. I remember being 16, and I skipped out on a few. You know, I skip, I was like, mm, don't need that one. They'd recommend it, but I don't need it. So I skipped out on it being a 16-year-old and trying to pretend I'm an adult and make my own decisions at that age. But like, man, don't not get a measles vaccine. You know, that's just crazy. That's insane because, you know, if I could sum up the anti-vaxxer community, Kevin, it's like this. It's like, you know, this th – uh, Let's say 99% of doctors agree. Let's even say 97% of doctors say you should get your measles vaccine, okay? 97. 97 of them are saying get the measles vaccine. It's going to potentially save your life. The other one, the other three tell you not to, okay? I would certainly trust the 97%, but in fact, the actual numbers are probably like 99.9% .9 are telling you to get them, you know? Um, this happens in climate science too. This 3% figure is always brought up in climate science. 3% of scientists disagree. 3% of scientists say climate change isn't happening, okay? But those 3% don't even have a cohesive picture of what actually is happening. They have no data that actually can answer the types of things that, that the other 97% are working on, okay? They have no cohesive structure. It, it'd be like if you go to the doctor, right, and you go to 100 doctors to get your di disease diagnosed, and 97% and of doctors say, you have lung cancer, we have to operate on you. The 98th doctor tells you to eat more oregano. The 99th doctor takes you, tells you to buy his multivitamin. You got to buy his multivitamin, take it. It'll cure you. And the 100th doctor tells you that you need to swim more. That's what it seems to be in the anti-vax and the climate denial communities is there's such a small sect of people that don't even have a cohesive agreement on what the downside is, both in climate science and in anti-vaxxing. And, but they're so good at marketing to people. They're so good at it. They're so good at it that they can, you know, go on YouTube and attract a bunch of followers. And, and before you know it, you know, you have an uprising of, you know, look at New York, what's happening in New York City right now. You have tons of, of you have essentially a measles outbreak because you have a large community of people that for whatever reason have been corrupted to believe that vaccines can cause autism. Which, by the way, I think I might rather have autism than die. So maybe that's just me. It's certainly always going to be a controversial kind of topic. It really is. You're going to get people on either side of the aisle on this. And it's good to hear somebody with your viewpoint because, again, I talk about echo chambers a lot. And a lot of the people that I will have on the show here, they're of the kind of same mindset as me. And it should be down to the individual that chooses. They should do their own research on these kind of things. So again, it's great to hear what you have to say to this so that the audience out there can take it on board so they can appreciate it. And again, so they can make their own minds up. And we were talking have... before the show about, you know, nowadays, and we're both on YouTube. So this is both relevant to us, but how things on YouTube can be taken so, so literally and then compare that to the way that, say, the black holes, for example, an announcement like that comes along and even though it's coming from people that are working on the telescopes that are actually taking in the data and stuff like that, they would rather believe somebody, anybody, over on YouTube versus the scientist. It's a really strange time we're living in, like we were saying before the show. And this applies to the anti-vaxxers as well, really, because I think we both agree that despite we might have strong feelings about these people having a voice and maybe confusing some people on certain topics, certain situations... We both agree they shouldn't have their platform taken away. And the anti-vaxxers, they've been kicked off of Facebook now. And today it's the anti-vaxxers. Tomorrow, who knows it could be. 
So it's something that really it's a, a weird kind of phenomenon that's taking place at a time when we've got all this information at our fingertips, Brendan. Yeah, don't worry, Kev. We're going to get to the black hole. Oh, definitely. I, I, I know we are. I, want... I like hanging out with you because I like having these open kind of exchanges with you. Yeah, And sometimes me too. when we don't 100%. agree, it doesn't matter that we don't agree because that's how we both kind of learn. We, we share ideas. And hopefully yeah. people in the wider audience can take that on board as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to say I am completely on board with the idea of free choice in most regards, but I'm I haven't yet made up my mind in the vaccine community. Um, and I'm not saying everyone should be forced to go out and line up and get vaccines, but you have to realize that that there's a such thing as herd immunity when it comes to things like measles, you know, and when you start violating the herd immunity, in other words, when you stop being immune to the disease, then you have implications on the entire herd of human beings around you. You know, I wouldn't want to send my kid to a school with a bunch of other kids that are susceptible to walk in the door one day with measles, you know? So in every single, and I don't have a kid, right? So may, maybe when I have a kid, all of a sudden, I'll, I won't mind if my kid doesn't get vaccinated. I don't think that's going to happen, but maybe I'll have a radical uh, shift of, of thought. Um, but I don't know. Like there's a lot of things, almost everything where I say, it's your choice. If you want to believe in the flat earth, believe in the flat earth. I don't care. It, I could not care less. But it's different when it comes to the fact that your choices are now affecting everyone around you. You know, that 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 that's when it gets kind of fuzzy. And I haven't made up my mind on that yet. I'm, I'm very much on the fence. And onto the YouTube thing that you're talking about, I completely disagree with silencing people. On YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, you know, I think the removal of Alex Jones from those platforms, because I think that was probably the first domino. Would you say that was the very first instance of this large-scale silencing, Kev? I, I really point to that as being the president setter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I completely disagree with that, 100%. I know that these companies like to pretend they're a private company and, and it's okay if they kick someone off their platform, just like you'd kick someone out of a bar or whatever, um, but it's it's a little different. It's quite different because these companies essentially have monopolized the marketplace for speech, you know. And so either you're going to be the monopoly, you're going to be Twitter, and you're going to have a monopoly on internet speech, and you're going to allow everyone to participate, or or you're going to to um, I don't know stop monopolizing the market somehow then regulations will have to be imposed on you. You know, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't be a monopoly in simul uh, on free speech and simultaneously not allow people to use it, you know, or someone's going to have to come in and say, Twitter, you're a monopoly on free speech, and we can't have you doing that if you're going to silence people. So Twitter's playing a very risky game, and so is, you know, these other YouTube and Facebook and, and that sort of thing, because there's literally no competition. There's none. On you for YouTube, there is none. There's Vimeo, which gets like, I don't know, 0.0001% of viewership. And also it's not even a free open marketplace because it, you have to pay money to upload content. You can upload some for free, but once you hit a threshold, you have to start paying. That's why my podcast isn't on Vimeo. I don't know if yours is, but if it's not, that's probably why. No, I've because started they, using um, D Live. It's on our service that's trying to get off the ground and when I, when I first heard about it, I was quite cynical, and I'm on there now. I'm I'm streaming. You know, there's a couple of hundred thousand people over on that platform, but it's just so damn hard to compete with something like YouTube and the parent company Google. And my fear is, you know, eventually they're going to reach a a kind of point where they're either bought out or something will happen to them. And again, these companies, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, they're just too darned powerful and some way somehow they'll snap up any rival that comes along yeah and they get away with it because what tends to happen is the people that make the legislation are really old and old people what do they tend not to have a very good handle on what's going on on the internet now that'll change in my when my generation gets old i think we'll have a better handle on what's going on on the internet but it's hard to convince a 70 year old congressperson in the united states who 
you know, literally doesn't even use most of these platforms. Or if they do, or if they are on the platforms, then it's probably just some secretary that they hire to Twitter post and Instagram posts and stuff like that. Um, it's hard to convince these people that there is such a place online where free speech is monopolized and that there's literally no competition. And it's hard to convince those people that it's a bad idea to start kicking people off. You know, it's almost like if if only certain people in America, you know, were allowed to utilize the First Amendment. It's hey, do, do you watch Black Mirror, Kev? Oh yes, indeed I do. Sometimes okay, I find it. Okay, do you know like a... that episode? I don't remember the name of the episode is, but there's an episode where you can get like deleted, where you can w walk around but no one can see your face, and you're just like this fuzzy like little patch. Yeah. You know, this that's that's essentially what happens when you get silenced on social media. Is you, you, you know, with deleted. the Chinese social credit scoring that goes on as well, I think that episode is going to become more and more oh, lifelike as time goes on. That's crazy, yeah. Isn't it? I know it really is. About. You know, so saying the wrong thing on, on YouTube, and who deems what the wrong thing is this week to next week? More the algorithm taking over there. And like you're saying there, you could literally end up unpersoned, you know, taken out, yeah. of, the, out, of, the and, out of the matrix. You know, and one of the problems that you and I maybe don't think about is that, Kev, you go to – what if you go to upload this episode and because we talked about Flat Earth in the episode, you make the title something like, you know, Discussing Flat Earth Society. Well, the algorithm might flag that video when in fact we are not, you know, advocating Flat Earth Society. We're merely joking and having a discussion about these people and how stupid they are. That's one of no the offense. problems that's actually occurring with the algorithm as we speak, because another subject along with Flat Earth that the algorithm is trying to take away from people's recommended list. And folks, I think people have got freedom of choice. I don't care what videos are on there as long as they're not violent. No kids are getting harmed. You know, it's common sense stuff. But um, what's happening is... Even people that are debunking these topics, Brendan, the algorithm, mm -hmm. it can't discern between debunking and covering the stuff. So even the voice match, when it kind of hears you talking about the certain keywords, if it's in your tags, anything like that at all. And you're right. You fall victim to the algorithm as well. So it kind of gives you a, a glimpse at the clinical, the, the, the non-empathetic, non-human side of what algorithms are really like. Yeah. And then that's 100% why I don't like the idea of silencing, and I especially don't like the idea of silencing based on what you know a computer deems unnecessary or unfit for the platform. I, I just don't like it. I think that if you throw all of the speech, all of the speech into one big vat, and you mix the vat up, then the good stuff will rise to the top, and the bad stuff will not. And you let human beings be the dic the dictator on what sorts of things they want to take out of their own personal vat. Do you want to take the flat earth out? Good. Well, you have a platform to do that. You can go on YouTube, you can type in flat earth, you can watch all your favorite flat earthers, you can go to your flat earth conferences, and you have the freedom to do that. And if you like doing that, and if you find joy in it, then I want you to do it. Good for you. I'm happy for you. Okay? But if you want to learn about black holes, and you want to listen to me, or you want to listen to to Brian Keating, or you want to listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson, there's an avenue for that too. And if that's the thing you like, then you can go on in your own personal vat with all the information mixed in, the internet, and you can pull out the stuff that you want to pull out. But by no means should we start, you know, have some overarching body like YouTube come by and, and look in the vat and be like, mm, we don't deem that inf that information good. Let's let's remove that. Let's remove that. Let's remove that. Because that that's a, that could be a runaway process really quickly, you know? To the point where legitimate news coverage, legitimate journalism, which doesn't tend to happen a lot anymore, legitimate journalism starts to get shut down. And and that's a problem. That's a real problem. Well, get this. We're almost coming up to the break, and we're going to be talking about it on the other side. But we're talking about algorithms. Uh, and I've got a little app that runs alongside YouTube. And it basically gives you help when you're, you're filling out keywords and descriptions and things like that. It keeps you right, Brendan. And it will tell mm -hmm. you if you've used a keyword in your tags or in your title that may run the risk of your video being flagged. And obviously, I've done quite a lot of shows. I've done a video on the fact that we had the black hole image coming out. And I was shocked, totally shocked to find that that word there, or those two words, black hole, is actually flagged by the algorithm. 
And that's because people. That's because people are trying to upload porn, Kev. That's exactly you see, why. you see, I did go through my mind, and we both obviously think far too alike. Our minds are in the gutter, <laughs> Mister Dracula. But yes, so it just shows you how again a topic there like black hole, because the algorithm cannot discern one black hole from another black hole. That this is why you'll end up maybe not being able to find information on that. And again, it doesn't matter if you believe in black holes or not. It doesn't matter if you believe in flat Earth or not. We should all have the choice to look at the information we want to look at. You can listen to us on the other side. Don't go anywhere. Brendan Drackler, astrophysics PhD student from the Rochester Institute of Technology, is here with me today. And he is also the host of the brilliant podcast called, you ready to write this down? The State of the Universe. And you can find that at thestateoftheuniverse.com. And that's all one word, thestateoftheuniverse.com. So please head on over there, check that out. He was telling us at the start of the show, he was only speaking to a Nobel Prize winner. I thought I was doing good last week with somebody who had lost the Nobel Prize. And Dr. Brian Keaton, but you know Brendan here, he always likes to go one up on me. He goes and gets a, a bona fide Nobel Prize winner. So Brendan, let people know where they can um, follow you, dude, because I know you're, I think you're on Twitter. I think you're on most of the anti-social networks, right? Yeah, I'm on them all. I'm on them all. I, I don't think I post anything too crazy to get silenced, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe one of these days if I start, you know, complaining about flat earth too much, the algorithm might boot me. But you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube. All that stuff, my it's at Brendan Drackler. So I have a unique name, so no one has taken it yet. But you probably can't spell it. So go on thestateoftheuniverse.com, and you can get all the links on there. The podcast is available everywhere. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, all the good stuff. You see, your name's German, I think, but for a Scotsman, it sounds like a really good Scottish name, Drackler. It, it's really so easy for us. It rolls off our tongue. So I, it is, it's the first time I've ever heard your surname, but, yeah, pretty cool, dude. It is German. It is German, yeah. See, yep. there you go. So then, let's do it, shall we? Will we finally get into the black hole? Well, not get into the black hole, but obviously the world was going nuts just the last week or the week before because we had the first ever image of this black hole or the event horizon and some of the light that was escaping it as X-rays and gamma rays. Like I said at the top of the show, you're the first person I thought of because... When we first spoke, you were telling me how you're working on, on writing algorithms, putting code together that will lead to a simulation of how two of these black holes will interact if they ever collide. And with the findings that you produce from these simulations, then astronomers at the biggest telescopes around the world, it's going to basically give them like a Rosetta Stone of stuff to look for, right? So you're into your black holes. You must have been beside yourself when you seen this coming out, Brendan. Yeah, this was legitimately the first sort of scientific announcement or press conference. And I will say that they did a great job of hyping this thing up. Like the image is coming out tomorrow. They got the word out everywhere. I don't know how many people tuned into the live stream. Did you tune into the live stream where it was released? Yes, Kev? of course. Yes. Yes. This must have been the single biggest live stream press conference release image in science history. It was fantastic. It was awesome. It was cool. Uh, it was the first one that I was legitimately excited about because it's almost like in every other scientific press conference, you know what is going to be announced. Let me give you an example. When when LIGO detected their first gravitational waves, you knew if they were holding a giant press conference and inviting all of the news stations there, you knew what they were going to announce. They were going to announce that they found gravitational waves. You know, it's it's not a spoiler. It's just common sense. But with this image, you literally didn't know. You didn't know if it was going to be an image of a black hole. You didn't know if it was going to be some other exotic thing that they found. You didn't know what you would see. And so it was incredible. I heard, I heard from people sort of on the inside here that they were going to release the image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy because they also had taken images of that one. But... It didn't look quite as appealing, and they haven't released these images yet, so we'll find out when they get released if I'm right. 
they didn't look quite as appealing and they thought that it wouldn't get as big of a buzz. That's amazing that you bring that up because I think it was around the turn of the year. I could be wrong. I was talking about a story that was in New Scientist magazine and I was really excited about it because it was all about the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. And they were basically talking about the fact that they were going to produce the first ever image of this black hole. Now, fast forward to the announcement, and they're talking about this M87 black hole, and I'm thinking, well, how come? I heard about one team that were talking about doing something with our own black hole, but now this is something totally different. So I'm glad you've brought that up because that's kind of cleared that up for me. So this is really part of the same experiment then. They were looking at our black hole as well. It's the same team. It's the same set of telescopes. They looked at, at the Milky Way's black hole. They looked at M87. And I'm not sure. I, I know some people. I'm actually quite close with some of my collaborators who actually, um, if you saw the, if you saw the black hole image put next to the like sort of pictures from a simulation. I don't know if you saw any of those. There's a lot of those are flown around, and you could see the resemblance. Like, wow, the simulation looks identical to the thing we saw. If you saw any of those pictures, uh, some of my collaborators are involved in producing those simulation images. And I heard, not from them, but but from some other people that, yeah, they were – you can go back and look at the promotional material for the, the, annou the announcement that they, they, they had put out to the press. And they were very careful to say, this will be the first image of a black hole. They were careful to say that. They didn't say of M87. They didn't say of the Milky Way galaxy because it was a crunch time and they had to make a decision. M87 looks really cool, but it's kind of a boring galaxy all right way far away. Not boring in the cosmic sense. It's doing interesting stuff, but it's definitely not as cool as the black hole really close to us, right? And so I think it came down to crunch time where they were like, which photo do we want to release? And they chose to release the M87 image. So describe to us then what we're actually looking at when we look at this image because, you know, we hear how light doesn't escape black holes, things like that. Yet here we have this image and it looks quite bright, quite, quite, you know, as if it's emitting light. Now, I went over this with Dr. Brian Keaton, but I'd love for you to explain it as well to the audience out there. You know, what is it we're actually looking at? Why are scientists so excited about this? Yeah, so the reason that you see the actual you know, the black, essentially the absence of light, that is the black hole itself. And all of that stuff around it is gas. It's gas that's swirling around, and, and we use radio telescopes to, to get emissions from that gas. That gas em emits photons in all sorts of different ways, all the way from x-rays, and you can look up the Chandra. Um, I'm not sure if you have us on YouTube today, Kev, but you can look up S Chandra, the Chandra x-ray image of M87, and that gives you an idea of what the center of that galaxy looks like in x-rays. And we have taken pictures of this galaxy with essentially every wavelength of light that you can use, from x-rays to optical telescopes to ultraviolet to infrared. And this particular one was taken with radio. And it was taken with radio for a very particular reason. The reason is that we can get really good resolution with radio telescopes if we use interferometry. What the, the goal of this project was to use telescopes literally – at every corner of our flat Earth, okay, at every corner of our flat Earth, we were going to use telescopes, radio telescopes, in America, in Chile, in Africa, in Australia. I'm trying to remember all the countries. But it doesn't matter. Don't you forget can look the, the event horizon. Don't forget telescope. the one down at the, the ice wall, I mean the South Pole. Yes, there's one down at the ice wall, of course. Can't forget that one, Kev. Thanks for, for clearing that up. So we use all of these these telescopes to create to try to create an image and i've tried looking up some analogies for how interferometry works why did we need to use all of the telescopes across the world okay i know intuitively my brain but i was trying to think of an analogy like how do i describe this to people and so i went on google and i tried searching to see if anyone else had come up with a good analogy and Literally no one has come up with a way to describe this to people, Kev. So I'll, I'll try to do my best here, okay? This is what I managed to come up with. Imagine that that black hole is a flashlight, okay? And the flashlight is emitting stuff. Now, of course, the black hole isn't emitting anything, but the gas around it is going to emit light because the gas around it is not yet inside the black hole. It is swirling around the outside. 
in what is called an accretion disk, okay? And you sent that article to me, and we'll talk about that article, the the fact that not only is there gas swirling around the outside, but this black hole is producing jets, and those jets are streaming towards the Earth. We'll talk about that in a minute. But imagine the black hole, the gas around it is a flashlight, okay? And you're shining your cosmic flashlight. If you only have one radio telescope, Kev, what, what happens as the light leaves the flashlight? What happens if you're in a dark room and you shine the flashlight? Is it like a laser? Is it just a single point? What happens to it? Oh, it lights up the whole room, right? Right. It fans out, right? It like creates this fanning effect where it fans out in all directions, all right? And if you shine it on a wall, what do you see? You essentially see a circle, right? Yep. You see a big circle. The further away from the wall you stand, the bigger the circle. That's the idea. Now, the idea behind the interferometer was this. If we just use one telescope, all right, imagine we're shining our light at the wall. If we just use one telescope and that telescope is on the wall somewhere, we're only going to see the light shining on top of that one telescope. Now, imagine we start putting telescopes all over the inside of our light circle that we're, sh we're shining on the wall. And all of a sudden, we're painting a cohesive picture. Not only are we seeing what the light circle looks like, you know, over here on the right side of the circle, we're seeing what it looks like on the left side of the circle, on the bottom, on the top. And the idea was to utilize telescopes all over the Earth to try to paint a cohesive picture of what this circle of light looks like, okay? And if you can create telescopes in over a big enough region, in this case, the co collecting area, the effective collecting area was the size of the Earth, okay? So by utilizing all of these circle, all of these telescopes all across our light circle, we have effectively created a telescope as big as the Earth itself, a radio telescope. And that allows us to get incredible resolution, resolution good enough to see the actual black hole at the center. And when I say see, of course, I mean not the fact that you don't see anything, right? This would have been a really boring image, Kev, if we got the image back and there wasn't actually any gas around the black hole and it was just a dark area. Because then we wouldn't even be able to see we saw a black hole. We would just say, oh, well, there's nothing there. Can you imagine but what the people would have said then if, like, it was just a big dark image and they said, you just have, just have to take our word for it that there's a black hole in the middle of it? Yes, I was telling people, you know, sort of in a joking way that, that man, this would have been so much more interesting if we didn't find a black hole. If there was no black hole and it was just like this really bright, compact object well, that you we see, had no that, idea what it was. This is why I got excited at the start of the year because usually we hear about the black hole, Einstein's take on things, and the science is quite set on that, despite a lot of it being still quite theoretical because you can't reproduce them in the lab, I get that. But the people who were working on this image of our own black hole, you know, he was, I can't remember the scientist's name, but he said what's even more interesting is the fact that what if there is no black hole there, like you said? And he was very open to finding something that they hadn't really suspected, nothing they'd accounted for. So again, it really helped to demonstrate that scientists, despite what we hear a lot of the time where people say that their minds are closed and you know, they've, they've got their kind of um, financing to think about, so they just tow the party line. This demonstrated that that's actually contrary to what goes on in science. People are very open to finding something that doesn't fit with the, the laws of science as we know them, right? Yeah, for the most part, I'll tell you an interesting story, because I, I do see, you know, people, and I, I mentioned in the, e in the email that I sent you this weekend of things that we could talk about, I, I mentioned a specific comment and the comment was saying that, you know, black holes, we don't know that they exist and, you know, all, all these other sorts of things. I was talking to Ray Weiss, who I had on my podcast last week, and he told me that when he was in at MIT in the 1960s, the culture there, the theoretical physicists there did not believe black holes existed. They did not. Ray Weiss said when he went to MIT – he had originally believed that they existed. He did as a young mind, you know, young, susceptible 16-year-old, 17-year-old. But when he got there, the theoreticians and the astronomers were so adamant about the fact that black holes were nonsense that they were literally convincing the students. And so Ray Weiss had been converted from someone who believed in black holes to someone who thought that they were fake, like some people today. And so, you know, this is evidence that, that even scientists – and then what does Ray Weiss go on to do? He goes on to build something to test whether or not black holes exist. And what does he find? That black holes exist. And, the, and this is historically how science should work. Now, there's always going to be certain people in science that want to, for whatever reason, cl clench onto an idea. And we can talk more about that in a minute because you know, I think I have a, a good idea of why that tends to happen. But 
generally we're very malleable as scientists. We change our beliefs very regularly, and Ray Weiss is an example of that. He he won the Nobel Prize, but some you know 50 years prior, he didn't even believe black holes existed. No, that's a really kind of good story, and I'd be glad to get your take on why that happens. I think it might happen, especially more with the older generation of scientists that have maybe built an entire career on one hypothesis or theory or another. And then, you know, after building a career on top of that, it must be quite hard when you're presented with information, maybe experimentation as well, that, that really blows everything you've put forward in the past out of the water. So I imagine that might be quite hard for the older generation to give up some of the ideas they've gone with. But again, I suppose it's individual, right? It's up to the, the person themselves, whether they're willing to keep an open mind, like you were saying there, and over time, you know, go back and forth between one theory or another. Yeah, I think that your assessment is it's it's exactly the assessment that I have. It's that these, you know, certain people will spend 40, 50 years working on an idea, you know, and the idea seems to work. It seems to make predictions that work. It seems to mit, fit the experimental data. It seems to fit everything perfectly. And these people are convinced that they are on the right track, that they are making groundbreaking findings until, you know, sometime they're 70 years old, they're getting ready to retire, they have 40 papers published, you know, and all of a sudden some news comes out, some experiment, some observation that that takes everything that they worked for and tosses it out the window. That's tough, okay? That's really tough, not just in science, but literally in anything, in anything. Do you think the first people, you know, imagine that there are people who are like expert pottery makers here in America. How do you think they felt when all of a sudden we were like, you're making pottery by hand. Uh, we're going to make a factory, and the factory is going to make the pottery for us. You know, or glass blowers, or or any paradigm shift. It's like people, it, yeah, when the, the people are putting the kind of the shoes on the horses and things, and then cars come along. You know. Yes, when the when paradigm shift, you have people who latch on to the old way. You, it's it's natural. It's a natural mode of survival, and it happens in science just as it happens anywhere else. And frankly. I'm not convinced that there's a way to avoid it. You know, if someone spends 60 years working on something, they don't want to be told that it's wrong and that it's nonsense. And so a lot of times what you see with people like this is they'll spend the remainder of their career just trying to come up with conjectures and come up with new ways to reconcile their theory because they don't want to accept that their theory is dead. You know, and this happened with the luminiferous ether, which – uh, some people in the comment section had had brought up on previous sessions we did. This exact same thing happened. People had invested their career in the idea that this exists. Do you know what this is, Kev, the luminous, luminiferous ether? No, tell me more, man. I'm sitting here. I'm intrigued. I want to learn more here. Okay, the luminous, luminiferous ether was this, this proposed um, – I don't want to call it fluid, just substance, I guess we'll call it. That permeated all of space, and it, it was a very popular idea back – at the mid to late 1800s. And see, see, I think it's like in my plasma, just, just to add in there, as opposed to a vacuum. I'm more of this electric kind of universe kind of guy, but I've said that to you before, so um, mm -hmm. maybe this is kind of similar along these lines. Sorry for interrupting you there. No, no, no worries, no worries. But the, the, the idea behind the luminiferous ether is, is essentially a good one. You know, any reasonable scientist would have come to the conclusion that it existed because here's what it is. How do we hear sound, Kev? Do you know how we – not through this complicated electronics shit. I don't even understand that. But I mean if we're just talking to one another, why do we hear each other? Is and why if we went into space would we not? Yeah, because it's uh, air vibrations, right? Right. You, you're sending waves through yeah. the air. There's a medium through which the waves travel. It's the same idea with water waves, right? Water waves travel through the water. There's a medium at which it travels through. Well – we had started to think as a community, and this was a widespread belief back in this time, that light must travel through some medium too. That there's no way light can just sort of like float on nothing. It ha it's a wave. It has to propagate through something, and that something must be the luminiferous ether. I don't know how it got that name. That's quite a name though. That's like a definitely good – that's a, a bit solid of, name. It's definitely a cool name, dude. Yeah. So – there was an experiment to test this, okay? The idea behind the luminiferous ether is that it should flow in one direction, okay, throughout the entirety of the universe. And because the Earth is revolving around the sun, we can start to test whether we emit a light beam 
you know, in June, if it if it travels faster than a light beam emitted in December, or if it travels faster than a light beam emitted in May, et cetera. And we could see light traveling through through different traveling with the luminous luminiferous ether versus against the luminiferous ether if it affects the speed at all. And so there was this device created called an interferometer, the very first interferometer. In fact, almost an identical representation of what LIGO turned out to be, although LIGO tries to do something a little different, um, was invented back in the 1800s. And this interferometer was essentially just a tabletop thing. And it would emit a, it would emit a light beam, and the light beam would get split, and it would send the two beams off that were split at right angles from one another. Okay, so one would go this way, the other one would go perpendicular to it. They would bounce off mirrors, they would come back, and they would check, did the light beams travel the same distance? In other words, did they get back at the exact same time? If they get back at the exact same time, then you won't see an interference pattern on your detector. If they get back at different times, then you'll see that the light waves are out of sync, okay? And so that's the idea behind the interferometer. So they devise this interferometer, they test it, and what they find is that Man, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know, that one beam goes this direction and the other goes perpendicular to it. It doesn't matter that one goes in the direction of the luminous or luminiferous ether and the other goes perpendicular to the luminiferous ether. They all get back at the same time. So therefore, light must travel at the same speed, regardless of its its path through the luminiferous ether. Now, what people wanted to do at the time, because they had spent their career trying to understand this is that they wanted to hang on to this idea. So rather than throwing it away and saying it's a bad idea, it's wrong, and something else must be going on, they latched onto it and spent decades trying to explain why their experiment didn't work. Okay, And this happens sometimes in science. This happens when you have a paradigm that lasts a long time. When you have, you know, this is happening with the, the quantum, the emergence of quantum systems today. You're gonna have a lot of people when quantum computers come on board who are like, wait a minute, I just figured out how to use Windows 10, man. Why are you switching to quantum computing? You know, I just figured out how to use my Dell. Don't be switching. So, but this will happen in all paradigm shifts. And this is just one example. And it wasn't until Einstein came along with the special theory of relativity that proved that light travels at the same speed um, regardless of your point of reference that we could then go do away with the luminiferous ether. But that that idea hang, hang, hung on for a long time, and a lot of people died trying to reconcile why that experiment did not work. Wow, and here we are 100 years later from Einstein's predictions, and, you know, that led to these things that were eventually called black holes, and here we are now looking at the first images of one. You know... Over a hundred years, we, we've come quite a long way. You know, if you could show Einstein what we have today, he, he probably would shake his head at some of the technology that's here, right? Yeah, it it's interesting because you know Einstein makes some makes some conjectures in his day about how we probably will never detect gravitational waves. In fact, I think he's been quoted, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, although literally everyone does, right? There are so many quotes attributed to Einstein that he never said. Um, but I'm worried about know, any quote I find on the internet, Brendan. Uh, nowadays, yes. I want to know where it was said, when it was said, and kind of multi-source it. Because like you say, there's so many things out there that people just take for granted. Yeah, it's attributed to him or her. And it really wasn't. A hundred percent. Yeah. Einstein, uh, man, I don't know. I, no one knows what he did and didn't say. But, you know, he has some papers published. And in those papers, he provides some commentary. And I'm pretty sure in one of the papers, he said that... Even though gravitational waves will be emitted from merging black holes, we will never be able to build the type of technology to actually detect them. And today we have it. Today we have it. And it is almost entirely constructed the exact same way that original interferometer built at the end of the 1800s was. Except, you know, we've done some, some vacuum technology to take all the air out and to avoid tons of interference and to try to avoid the shakiness of the earth and you know all of these other things that make it more and more and more precise because in order to detect deviations due to gravitational waves you're talking about deviations in space time on the order of one one thousandth the width of a proton okay that is a really small deviation and to be able to detect it you have to be really precise in your measurements of light 
And so that that model is almost entirely built upon the model that existed when Einstein was alive. Uh, it truly is amazing. And of course, if we go back to the 1930s, and this kind of sets us up for our number two on the show, we had astronomers, you know, they were looking at the motion of galaxies out there. But there was a problem because something didn't fit. Something didn't seem right because when they were looking at the motions, they weren't behaving as they had predicted. And this led to a lot of head scratching at the time. But what it led to was the idea that there must be something else going on up there. Something that they can't observe, something that we are yet to ever observe. And this is, of course, where dark matter comes into the picture. Now, we've been talking about things on the show tonight where, where people rightly question everything. And I, and I do encourage people to question everything. I've got a little saying, you all know it by now, keep your mind open, but not to the point where the brain falls out. However, I question this whole thing with dark energy, dark matter. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this after the break. We're going to get Brendan's take on all of this good stuff. And I, and I find, you know, that a lot of the kind of conspiracies, a lot of the wilder things that you find out there on the internet nowadays is born out of a gap in the information. It's because we don't understand enough about one thing or another that we're left to speculate, we're left to kind of um, lift our own devices to come up with what one thing or another means. So we're going to listen to Brendan after the break. We're going to try and figure out what this dark energy, dark matter is all about. Join us for hour number two. Hour number two on today's Kev Baker show, and it's brought to you by the scientists at NASA. I'm only joking, folks, but... When me and Brendan team up, it seems that there's a lot of people out there suspect that we do a lot of shilling for NASA. And because we've got a sense of humour, we like to play on that little kind of uh, role that we've been assigned, don't we, Brendan? Is, is that your NASA patch I see in the background Yeah, there? I think I might get it sewed on my shirt <laughs> right there. <laughs> that that on for... one side, and, and obviously you could have your flat earth map on the other side. Exactly, yeah. And I'll just wear this shirt specifically for your show, Kev. <laughs> That but, way, everyone knows the information I'm spewing is factual. Absolutely. And they should believe me. And, of course, you'll probably go on to work for NASA one day, you know, with the kind of stuff that that you're doing right now. Imagine, imagine what the trolls are going to say then, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well you, you could be you my know. inside guy at NASA. You could be, like, my whistleblower. We'll, like, alter your voice and things. We'll make you sound, like, dead mysterious and cool. I'm convinced, actually, that if, you know, if I did get a job at NASA, that I could make a killing online by by being you know like a fake insider at nasa and just you know spreading some some fake information hey what's another YouTube? fake insider from nasa there's plenty of them already out on the internet right yeah and they're may they're probably making you know a couple dollars here and there for interviews so <laughs> man i think if i could run with that me and you might set that up tonight kev God, get that underway shh, shh. we'll keep that we'll keep that under wraps for now <laughs> and we're gonna get into something in just a moment dark matter dark energy all of that controversial stuff. Is it even stuff? But before we get there, Brendan, I'm really keen to get more and more people over to your work. So give them your website, when they can hear the shows. Give them a flavor of the guests as well, dude. So the website is thestateoftheuniverse.com. All one word. No spaces. Okay? So we have – I have – some am amazing guests on there from Nobel Prize winners to the, the person in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, you know, to the, the people who discovered the first fast radio bursts, everything in the world of science. I try to get a flavor for everything I have. You know, the if you're familiar with, you know, there's essentially one famous book on CRISPR, one famous book on CRISPR, and it was written, co-written by Jennifer Doudna, which is a name that your viewers might recognize, a very, very popular woman in the world of CRISPR, and then Sam Sternberg. I've had Sam Sternberg on the show. So I try to get you know, a flavor of all of these different – because I'm not an expert in CRISPR. I don't know shit about CRISPR. You know? <laughs> I, I had a you – know, I had a last, – last month, I had um, an expert in the common cold working to cure the common cold. So I had him on there. Why is it that we haven't cured the damn common cold? We cure all these other diseases. Why can't we cure the virus that is the common cold? 
And so I like to, you know, get into these discussions with, you know, experts who know this stuff better than anyone. We're not talking about people who make YouTube videos. We're talking about people who study this for a living. And I try to get into their brain and and understand why the problems are so tough. And more importantly, you know, try to get into to, to the mind of a, of a scientist, you know? Why do we pick certain ideas over other ideas? You know, we'll talk about dark matter and dark energy in a minute. Why is it so many people are are latched onto those ideas as opposed to some other idea, you know? No, absolutely. And as I said to you, I mean, I'm no expert. I, I never try and hide that. I just like science. But when it comes to dark matter, dark energy, it, it's, it's hard, you know, when it's something invisible and we're just told to believe it's out there. And I often say to the listeners, again, it's just my way of looking at it. Sometimes I suspect it's just a really convenient way of making the maths work, of kind of explaining some of the things that they can't explain that they're seeing. But that's just my take on it. And of course, I like to look at CERN. And I was reading today that CERN's take on dark matter, and again, it's their take, but they think it might be in amongst the weakly interactive range of particles. So mm -hmm. right now, their detectors, they're not really looking for that, but they're going to come up with a new experiment called PHASER. That's F-A-S-E-R, and it's called the Forward Search Experiment. So it's going to be a 10-meter-long pipe. It's going to run beside one of the injection rings. I think it's one of the initial synchrotrons. But it's going to have a look for these things. And again, they're very kind of open to the fact that it might be a weakly interactive particle. On the flip side of that, it might not because we just don't know. So what's your take on all of this good stuff, the dark energy, dark matter? Let's start with dark energy because I think it's the easiest and it's the one that I am most convinced actually exists. Okay. And this is the, the important this is the important thing about dark energy, is it's not even describing a thing. It's describing an observation. Right, so dark matter is a dark matter is a little bit out there because you know you're actually describing a thing. You're describing a halo of objects around galaxies that somehow contains mass, but yet we're not quite sure what it is. You know, and that that involves a more detailed discussion. But dark energy is maybe a little easier. Um, the idea of dark energy comes from a very simple observation, and it's the observation that galaxies far away from us are moving away from us, okay? And the further away they are, the faster they're receding. And you can look at other galaxies, and you can say that those galaxies are receding from one another. It's as if the space between us is growing, okay? And the way that you determine that a galaxy is moving away from you is you analyze its spectrum, okay? Kev, imagine that you know, you're looking at a galaxy far away, and you know that this galaxy has hydrogen in it. And hydrogen, if you look at it with a radio telescope, has a very particular emission. It emits at a very particular wavelength, and you can analyze that wavelength. And, you know, uh, do you have the YouTube set up, Kev? Are people yeah, going to be yeah, able to yeah. see this? they'll be able to see this afterwards, yeah. Okay, so imagine that, that, you know, there's a spectrum here across my forehead, essentially. And you know that hydrogen emits right here, right here, every time. But you're observing galaxies, and for some reason the hydrogen peak is shifted a little bit over here or even further over here. Well, that's a, due to the actual spectrum being shifted. It's shifting. And how does the spectrum get shifted? Well, it gets shifted by motion when things move away from you or towards you. It's like a slinky, okay? Imagine, Kev, that you and I are standing in a room. We're holding a slinky, right? We're holding an outstretched slinky, and you walk away from me. What happens to the slinky? It gets stretched, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, the wavelength of the slinky, if you think of each little slink as a wave, will get elongated. It will get stretched. And that's what we call redshift. We have light that is being shifted more towards the red, longer wavelength side of the spectrum. It's exactly identical to just holding a slinky in a room and walking away from one another. You take the slink, the, the slinks, the individual little slinky components, and you're stretching them. You're elongating them. There's no difference, um, at least in the analogy, between that and what we see with galaxies. And the same can be said for blue shifting. If you analyze a galaxy and it's blue shifted, that means it's coming towards you. That's if we're holding the outstretched slinky and you start walking towards me. You know, the 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 gaps in between the, the individual um, yeah, the waves get units, more, they become they get more smaller. frequent. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So that's the it, the idea behind a red shift and a blue shift. And what, and what we notice is that galaxies 
The further away they are, the more redshifted they tend to be. Now, how could that make sense? How could all galaxies in the universe be simultaneously moving away from one another? Well, the only way that makes sense is not if there was some explosion and all galaxies are being you know, thrown out from some central hub, but if it's the space between them is literally expanding. You know, the space between us and the closest galaxy. Now, this is where people s tend to say, but wait a minute, isn't Andromeda moving closer to us? Yes, it is. And that's because gravity tends to overpower whatever this force is, you know? And I say whatever it is because we don't know what it is. We don't know. That's why we call it dark energy. We call it dark energy because, you know, it's we're essentially in the dark. We have no way of explaining precisely what this mechanism is. We just can observe that it's happening, right? And I, I don't think you could go up to any scientist, and no scientist would try to, at least not a good one, would try to tell you that he knows what dark energy is, and he'd try to you know, sit you down and talk you through it and sell you on his idea. Because frankly, no one in this community has a consensus yet. We don't know. We know that there's some vacuum energy. There's some something interesting about empty space that causes it to expand. Okay, and it doesn't happen between us and Andromeda because Andromeda is so close, and the gravitational attraction between the two galaxies overcomes whatever that repulsive force is. Okay, so the way to think about this, if you want to think about an analogy, and this is literally the only good one I've ever heard, is to think about it as raisin bread. You know, if you make raisin bread, what happens when the bread cooks? It begins to grow and grow, and what happens to the individual raisins in the bread? Well, they don't speed away with each other oh, uh, from each other with some velocity. They still have the same amount of stuff in between them, but that stuff begins to grow, and it slowly pushes them apart. And that's almost the exact same idea behind dark energy. And so am I convinced that that dark energy exists? Yes. Do I know what it is? No. And no one does. No one has any idea. But I am convinced that there is some mechanism, some something, something I don't know what it is that causes galaxies to recede from one another, okay? Are we, is there inverse gravity? I don't know, okay? But the point is, I believe the observations because you could go and do the observations yourself. If you could feasibly build a telescope, okay? You could, if you were rich, all right? And you don't even have to be too rich to build a telescope. You just have to be rich enough. You build a telescope all on your own in your backyard. You could go out there and you could look at some of these distant galaxies and you could calculate the redshift yourself. This is a very easy thing to do, and you could come to the same conclusion that galaxies seem to be moving away from us, and the further they are away, the faster they're receding. So that's dark energy. Do you have any questions on dark energy? Do you think we're just a technological advancement away then, some kind of telescope that we haven't imagined yet that will answer some of the questions as to what really makes up dark energy in the future? Are you hopeful there? No, because... I dark, whatever dark energy is, whatever it is, it's baked into the universe, right? This is like a, a Brian Keating type question because whatever dark energy is, it's a it's a component of whatever cosmological structure created this universe we're in right now. Okay. It's not something that can be observed. It's at least not outside of, you know, you couldn't see something because it's not something. You know, it's not like something. It's just energy it's it's vacuum energy it's some repulsive force you can't see gravity right the only how do you see gravity how do you even know gravity exists well you know gravity exists because if you drop a, a water bottle it falls to the ground right well, unless you're him? a flat earther in <laughs> which case the earth is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared and so when you drop the bottle of water the earth accelerates up to it but either way you can observe it by its effect on the things around it right that's the exact same idea with dark energy. You're not doing anything any different. You're just observing that galaxies are moving away, and you're making some some, you know, conjecture that or th theory even that there is some repulsive force pushing things apart. Just because, I mean, to be honest, Kev, we don't even understand the fundamental way gravity works quite yet. No, we don't. You know, um, well, what we have the general we, theory of relativity, where which works damn good, but. There's no, you know, if you look at the history of science, every theory that's ever been proposed has eventually been proved wrong, except for the ones that haven't, which exist today. So with that in mind, there's nothing to say that, 
you know, some observation might not come along tomorrow that proves an aspect of general relativity wrong. And if that does happen, then we'll have to go back to the drawing board. We'll have to understand what the mistake is. And it could be a mathematical mistake that Einstein made. I mean, he's he's known to make them. Uh, Ray Weiss talks to me about that on the most recent episode of my podcast too, about how you can find mistakes that Einstein made in the math. Yeah, Brian Back- Keaton, he, he was kind of pointing out the fact that, you know, it showed how he was he was human after all, despite, you know, some of the claims you hear about Einstein, the fact that he did make mistakes. Uh, yeah, he, one of the interesting things when you study his career is that he wasn't good at math. Didn't he start you know, he working wasn't, in the patent office? Is that not where he came from originally? He worked like in one of the patent offices. Yeah, he was a he was a, a scientist. He had gone to school, but he was so bad at going to class. He didn't like going to class. He didn't do well in the courses, not because he wasn't smart, but because he didn't try. He didn't care. He didn't have motivation. And that education tends to do that to a lot of people, actually. You know, I often wonder how many geniuses were left behind because they just don't fit into that go to school model. I hate it. You know, when I was taking courses, oh my God, I hate it. You know, the idea of sitting in class, like I don't even know how I sat in class for eight hours as a as a high school student. You go to class for eight hours, you know, that's horrendous. I don't know how anyone learns that way. I certainly am not good at it. So and Einstein wasn't good at it either. So his torturous. grades sucked. What was that? That sounds torturous. Eight hours listening to all of that stuff, dude. Yeah, well, that's in high school, right? I, every kid goes through that, at least here in America. You know, you're in high school. You show up at 8 a.m. You leave at, you know, 4 p.m. You get a 30-minute lunch for break or whatever, a 30-minute break for lunch. So I mean, it's – yeah. I don't know how kids learn in the environment. It's the indoctrination it's, centers. That's what it is. That's what it's, it's like. It's terrible. But you don't, and then you have standardized tests, which only you know do bad things for the kids. It's it, the, our education system is fundamentally broken. Oh, definitely, think, definitely. And you see, like you say, so many geniuses, so many people that have left their mark on the world, and their names will be you know known forever. They didn't finish school, like you're saying. That they they didn't fit with that. The way their brains worked, it wasn't for the structured kind of education that we get. I think if we ever are to make a better world, you know, for a, again, my utopic kind of ideology, I think we need to change the education system, you know, from the, the, the top down, Brendan. We need to find a totally different way of doing it. You know, maybe encourage children to learn about subjects that they're actually interested in. Some people are more practical than textbook based. So, you know, really tailor to the, the individual as opposed to this kind of um, mass production that they try and churn out at the end of high school and university sometimes. I agree 100%. I want to say this. I know you have some listeners from uh, the United States, and there is this great program that I would encourage you if you have kids to get your kids involved in. It's called the Pulsar Search Collaboratory, and it's a summer program where you can sign up. It's, It's completely funded by the National Science Foundation, so you don't have to pay anything. You sign your kid up. And your kid will do some small online courses. It won't take very much time. It's not like sitting in a classroom that teaches them how to do real research on pulsars. And then in the summertime, you will travel down to Green Bank, West Virginia for a couple of weeks, and you will do hands-on science with real data, real pulsar data. And you'll get to make real discoveries and potentially get your name on real published scientific articles. Um, it's this great thing that is available for any high school student in in this in America, at least. I'm not sure they do, you know, international stuff yet, but I encourage you to do that. You can just search Pulsar Search Collaboratory. And I think that things like that, I'd like to see more of them, where you could get kids involved in something that isn't just sitting in a classroom, because that makes kids want to be not go to college. It makes them it honestly, it just takes the motivation out of them completely. No, you're you you're know? absolutely right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, just to go back to the the dark energy. Before I forget my train of thought, I often do that, Brendan. You know, oh, I already forgot mine. I, I go on tangents here, there, and everywhere. But you know, because we're you know they haven't really explained what dark energy is yet, and I agree with you. It must have been pervasive from the moment of be it a big bang, be it whatever it was that set everything in motion. It must have been there. And I wonder if there's a chance. You know, probably a theory out there. I'm sure it is, but. Almost this dark energy being like the Higgs field, you know, made up of a as of yet unnamed quantum particle or something that we're yet to detect. And 
like you say, it's everywhere. It's throughout the entire universe, and that's what's causing the, the shift in the movement of, of all of these galaxies. So probably that's something that CERN will go on to try and uh, make a proof of concept experiment in the future, right? Yeah, I, it's it's one of the weirdest things. It's man, and it makes up you know sixty some odd percent of the energy content of the universe. Yes, our, our so, observable universe. I mean, what do we see in reality? The things that we can see and touch now in space. I mean, how much of that statistically? makes up the universe it's quite a small percentage so, isn't it yeah so what we call like baryonic matter which is matter made of baryons which are the things that you actually observe in everyday life and the things you can see with the telescope it makes up about 4.9 percent of the universe in terms of overall energy content yeah it's a tiny fraction a tiny and that's assuming the that's assuming the um what's called the lambda cdm model which is the per prevailing model in cosmology and brian keating could speak for days about it and why we believe it to be true but it essentially says that we live in a universe that has dark matter and has dark energy and in a universe like that normal matter makes up about 4.9 percent wow so dark matter then What's your take on this? What's the difference between dark matter and dark energy? What's your take on all of this? So dark matter is is something completely different. And I will say quick that the, they did a really bad job of naming these things. Okay, I often wonder how much skepticism of dark matter and dark energy comes purely from the name. Because when you say dark matter, you're implying that it's some matter that you can't see. And humans hate stuff that they can't see. Right, we're very much, at least in this day and age, we're very much a, a hands-on, I want to see it to believe it type of culture. But but then um, when you say to people, well, in reality, if seen as believing, do appreciate that you only see less than one twentieth of what's going on in this entire universe, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and then they'd say, well, I don't believe dark energy or dark matter. Um, so so let's talk about dark matter. Uh, dark matter is a completely separate idea than dark energy. And dark energy, I, I didn't get to talk much about the, I'll use the, the little bit left on the, before the break here, Kev, to, to give you some historical perspective about dark energy, because I do think it's an interesting and important. Okay. Oh yeah. When Einstein theorized general relativity back in 1915, when he published his papers, he included what's called a cosmological constant, okay, into his equations. And it wasn't a tinkering, okay? It wasn't a tinkering so much as it was a fine-tuning, all right? It's not like he was just adding terms into his equations in order to make them right. He was noticing that those terms were there and then trying to explain why they were there. And in explaining why they were there, he literally fine-tuned the universe, and this is one of his blunders, is – he assumed that the cosmological constant, as he called it, was such that it would make the universe flat, stationary, and non-expanding, closed, essentially. Okay, Because Einstein, at the time, through whatever cultural reason, it got put into his head that the universe is not expanding. Are you telling it's... me that Einstein was a flat universer? Einstein was a flat universer, yep. Dang. Yeah. Although general relativity is the description <laughs> for why space-time gets curved. Oh, you, so know I love, you know I curved. love to beat you, Brendan. You know I, I know. do. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm... <laughs> so, um, so, you know, Einstein believed he was a, he was a closed universer, okay, these damn people. And he thought – and he invoked this into his equations such that the universe would be closed off. All right. It wouldn't be expanding. It wouldn't be accelerating. It wouldn't be doing all of the things that we observe it doing today. And we found out – and he eventually, you know, when Edwin Hubble began noticing that galaxies were moving away and the universe was expanding, Einstein went back on that and said that was the biggest blunder of his career. He made a real big mistake because he fine-tuned his equations to meet the universe that he thought should exist. All right, and that's not how science is done. Science is done by, by coming up with some principles – first principles, and then letting observations, letting experiments teach you about what those principles should be as you continue on. You know, you come up with some set of equations, and you let experiments govern how those equations are going to play out over time, essentially. 
Okay. And it's different for every field and different people handle it differently. And so Einstein is someone who got, gets away with it. He gets away with avoiding first principle calculations because he's so damn smart. You know, like it's still – you still have to sit back and ponder like how did Einstein even come up with general relativity and special relativity? He literally came up with special relativity, Kev, not by starting from some mathematical underpinnings but by just imagining what it would be like to be you know, floating alongside a light beam as it travels at the speed of light. Yeah, I've heard that before, man. Uh, uh, same. Pretty he was weird. a really bad mathematician, but he was the greatest physicist to ever live. He, In terms of like his ability to, to picture in his brain the physical world and the way it works, he was at a level that no one I don't think will ever be, has, at has least certainly not me. Has mathematics um, taken over the physics too much? In certain – it's funny you bring this up today of all days because I was having a conversation with some some colleagues this morning about this very topic. We had went to a talk last week, and the talk was a quantum gravity talk, and it was a talk about how you could feasibly communicate through black holes. It was a talk about wormholes. You know, It was a theoretical talk. It has no way to test it. Um, it was just like a here's what the math shows us. Like we could do these interesting things. And one of the interesting things was you could feasibly communicate through a black hole. You could send information into one black hole and you could retrieve it from another black hole, some other place in the universe. Okay. Really weird concept, really tough math. And I sat down this morning and I thought, what's the point of it? Like, what's the point of doing that research? I don't get it. Because sure, it might show you something interesting, but there's no way to test it. There's no way to utilize it, you know, at least not in this century or decade or what have you, you know. So, yeah, I think that there are some, you know, if you think of science as a spectrum, you have experimentalists on the left and you have, you know, the real theoreticians on the right. There are some people that are really far to that right side that are doing things um, in, on the theory aspect of things that uh, could, just can't be tested. You know, it's just – symbols, moving symbols around and trying to come up with interesting results. And while that is fun, and if those people enjoy doing that, then by all means, continue doing it. But I'm not convinced that uh, that it's a very useful way to spend your time, specifically if you start talking about like a lot of people. You know, if we started seeing millions of people getting on the the right side of the physics spectrum and no people over here doing the experiments, then we would have a problem. But I think it's a good balance right now. I think there's only a few people that, that have gotten too far deep in the math. And, you know, funny, because I was telling the audience, quantum gravity, that, that's something I've been checking out just recently. I think it's somebody called Leonard Suskind. He, he talks about this. I might have his first name wrong. But it just shows you, myself and Brendan, we know how to make a valuable use of our time. We geek out to science. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Final segment with today's special guest. His name's Brendan Drackler. He is the host and the man behind the podcast called The State of the Universe. Now, you can find that over at the website of the same name. All one word, thestateoftheuniverse.com. So I urge you all to check that out. And before we get back into it, don't forget Lucky coming up right after today's show with Dr. Brooks Agnew with Quantum Connections. And we'll be getting into quantum as this next segment of the show progresses. And then on Wednesday night here, I'm going to be joined by the boss man. Yes, Mr. Chris Geo will be in the house. He is going to be coming on. We're going to be talking about IA life and getting into some simulation theory, I think I'll be asking Chris about. We'll probably be talking about artificial intelligence and if the last time myself and Mr. Geo hooked up is anything to go by, you know, remember that Facebook banned us in 248 countries around the world and obviously beyond the veil in another universe as well because it doesn't matter what Google search you use, there ain't 247 or 248 countries in the world. So that's our claim to fame, Brendan. We were banned in this dimension and the next. So thank you for letting me take a brief moment there to let people know what's coming up. And of course, we're one week closer, one week closer to Jordy Rose, founder of Sanctuary AI. He will be coming on the show. 
He was telling me today he really enjoyed last week's episode with Dr. Brian Keating. I imagine he'll be enjoying today's episode with this astrophysics PhD student from the Rochester Institute of Technology, Brendan Drackler. So, Brendan, we've got one segment left. I don't know if we want to get into quantum gravity and melt people's brains right now, or if we're going to touch on this dark matter, because we, we kind of touched the dark energy. But dark matter, what's your take on this stuff? Dark matter is a little bit more involved. Um, so dark matter isn't so easy to explain the theoretical underpinnings, okay? And so it doesn't – it comes from observations. You know, the reason for it comes from observations. It comes from the fact that that um, Fritz Zwicky, okay, which by the way is maybe the coolest name in all of science. Fritz Fritz Zwicky was was studying the the so-called coma cluster, which is a cluster of about a thousand galaxies. Okay, how how crazy is that? How crazy is that we have thousands of clusters with thousands of galaxies in each, and inside of each galaxy there's hundreds of billions of stars. And around those stars, there's potentially planets, and on those planets, there's potentially life. See, this is Man, the, the thing that melts my head. <laughs> this is the massiveness that the, I was educating little kids about this this past weekend. You know about exoplanets and the vastness of everything. And man, I could just see it melt their head too. You know, I so, was speaking to one of my little cousins just the other day, and he had obviously been looking at the YouTube video that shows you that our star, you know, that sun that really brings us mm -hmm. life and every day so insignificant when you actually compare it to other stars out there around the universe. You know, I think yeah. by the time you look at this giant one, you, you can barely see our actual star. It barely takes up one pixel on the screen, Brendan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. look how powerful, yeah. look how reliant we are on that. It's amazing. Yeah, next time I come on, we can do a whole show about exoplanets and, and that sort of thing. Oh, um, sounds amazing. Try yes. to blow people's mind. But, um, you know, dark matter... Dark matter is that you know we were studying this coma cluster. Fritz Zwicky was studying the coma cluster, and he was analyzing individual galaxies and their and their um, velocity around the center of the cluster, because in these giant clusters you have galaxies orbiting around the center of the cluster, almost the same way you have stars orbiting around the center of the galaxies inside of those clusters. Okay, and so he's analyzing this cluster, and and he's looking at them, and he's thinking, you know, he's analyzing the velocity of a lot of these these galaxies, and something peculiar is happening. They're traveling way too fast to be gravitationally bounded by the system, okay? They're traveling incredibly fast that they should be exceeding the escape velocity. So here on Earth, our escape velocity is 11.2 kilometers per second, which is equivalent to like 25,000 miles per hour. So if you want to you know, send a rocket off of the off of the face of the Earth, you have to exceed that escape velocity. So when I'm watching to... Elon and SpaceX and things like that, that, that's the number he's aiming for to get out of here, right? Yeah, he's going into low Earth orbit, you know, but if you want to go to Mars, then yeah, you're aiming at, you want, you need to get your vehicle up to 25,000 miles per hour. Wow. Okay. And so yeah, now you can, now you get a sense of how tough that could be, you know, like launching someone off of the face of this, especially, you know, when you have tons and tons of cargo that's a that's a tough business it's like to be strapping in. yourself to the world's biggest firework yes <laughs> yeah Truly it's, is, it's, man. it's crazy oh yeah. i hope to go to space one day but it is terrifying yeah the thought of it is terrifying okay but we're we're analyzing these galaxies and they're going too fast well how could they be contained how could they stay in there well the answer is that they are not just revolving around whatever's at the center of the cluster. But in fact, there's a lot of mass on the outside of the cluster too that is sort of keeping them bound, okay? So, and then, you know, further studies go on to analyze the stars in our own Milky Way. And we're analyzing the way that our star, the stars in our own Milky Way orbit about the center of our galaxy. And we're noticing a very similar thing. These stars are moving really quickly they are exceeding the escape velocity of the center of our galaxy. They should be getting flung off into intergalactic space, but they don't. Why don't they? Well, then we have two things to go on, okay? If you, when you come to that conclusion, you essentially could go two ways. You could say, okay, if we take you know, some invisible mass that we can't see or, and we can't yet detect, and we put it on the outskirts of the galaxy, and, key, and wimps are not the only thing proposed here. 
You know, we talked about weakly interacting massive particles. Um, those aren't the only things that are proposed to make up dark matter. There's also people proposing black holes and you know all sorts of other weird stuff going on out there. The problem is we should be able to detect via light things like black holes or stars or white dwarfs or like some exotic, you know, people have even proposed rocks. Like maybe there's a lot of rocks out there, you know, but none of that seems likely or probable based on our understanding of galaxy formation. So, you know, people have come up with this, this dark matter in the form of subatomic particles that only interact gravitationally and through the weak force. And neither of those we can detect with visible light. All right. Now, the other idea that has been proposed is that, well, maybe Newton was wrong. Maybe the way in which we're trying to – maybe the way that we calculate the escape velocity in this framework is wrong. And so there was a, a person, and um, I want to give his name for the sake of him, Mord Mordhai Milgram, okay, another really cool name in science. Back in 1983, he didn't like the idea of invoking, you know, invisible mass that sits on the outskirts of the galaxy. So he came up with something called modified Newtonian dynamics. Okay, in modified Newtonian dynamics, they they essentially say the following thing: they say Newton lived in a world in the same world that we all do, and it's in a world where we only deal with large accelerations. You know, if you throw a ball, it's accelerating pretty fast, right? If you kick someone, your foot is accelerating pretty fast. Um, if you're on the Earth, then you're accelerating pretty fast. The Earth is moving at, at, at quite a high speed, um, and its centripetal acceleration is decently high. So we live in a world, and we've come up with laws to describe a world where the acceleration is high. But for individual stars going about the center of a galaxy, their acceleration is pretty small. So maybe... Newton didn't account for this when he derived Newtonian mechanics. And in fact, we should modify Newtonian mechanics to take into account how these things work when the accelerations are tiny. And Mond did that. Modified Newtonian dynamics did that. They came up with a framework to describe how stars should move when the accelerations are very, very tiny. And it it had a lot of success, okay? I wrote down some things. I'm not an expert in Mond. I've Talk to some people who work on this. There's still a lot of people working on this today on different theories of alternative gravity that try to attack this problem differently, right? Um, I notice that a lot of people tend to think that like dark energy is the dominant idea. And it, for all intents and purposes, it is the dominant idea or dark matter is the dominant idea. You know, the idea that there's there's all of this, you know, speckled matter on the outskirts of the galaxy that are keeping the stars from flying off. That is the dominant idea. But there's also a ton of other ideas floating around the industry. And the, the other ideas are getting funding too. The NSF is paying for people to try to understand this because we're spending a lot of money trying to detect dark matter with no success. You know, we're spending hundreds of millions, if you count CERN, if you count CERN as being a dark matter detector, you know, because it is very much trying to detect subatomic particles and you know, dark matter might very well be a subatomic particle. So if you count CERN, then we're spending probably tens of billions of dollars to try to detect it. And even, so the you end know, with something like that, CERN, it's a good example to use. You know, they're determined to find these, in their opinion, they're going to be looking for the, the weakly interactive mass of particles. That, that's what they're looking for. And, you know, mm -hmm. because they're going down that road and because they're they're determined one way or another to detect this dark matter... It could be a case of, you know, any kind of wimp that they actually detect in there. They may attribute that to being dark matter. However, just because they've detected it doesn't really mean it explains dark matter, right? Exactly. It could, it could just so, be there. Yeah, and if you look in any of the literature, it's very clear. It's very clear that even if CERN detects something, even if they discover some new subatomic particle, it in no way verifies dark matter's existence. It doesn't, because then we would have to cross-reference that discovery with a real discovery from actual dark matter interactions. You know, idea, the, 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 in a perfect world, what you would have and what these, these people are looking for is they're looking for these dark matter particles to somehow interact. We don't expect them to interact often. We don't expect them to interact, you know, um, on a large scale, 
But what if we get one or two interactions? Or what if the dark matter is, you know, dark matter is likely permeating every region of this galaxy? That's why I think it's like a field. It's almost like the Higgs field. You've got the dark matter field, you know? Yeah, if you look up, I'll, I'll, um, I'll send you uh, a link, Kev, that you could show on on YouTube. Um, this is a great – it's a it's a Wikipedia page, but if you scroll to the bottom of the Wikipedia page, um, there's a fantastic image. And it's an image with this like purple hue throughout it. Let me know if you see it. Yeah, I can see it there, yeah. Okay. Now, one of the ways in which we know that dark matter exists outside – of you know simply analyzing and this is actually the one thing that that mond doesn't do well so this modified newtonian dynamics does a lot of things well it predicts the rotation curve of the galaxy really well it predicts the way that dwarf galaxies um orbit really well it makes tons of predictions that are right all right it predicts some very interesting things and for a long time people were looking at this as like wow this might be the thing that kicks dark matter out of there. But if you look at this picture, what this picture shows is it shows a series of gravitational lenses. Okay, if you if you would, Kev, go ahead on Google and just type in um, gravitational lens, and you can find. I don't know if you've ever seen these images before, but no. gravitational lenses, you can see like this really blurry image surrounding a galaxy. Yeah. You see something like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. These gravitational lenses are found um, with our with the best telescopes, and what they are is Einstein tells us that that space time curves when massive objects are on top of it. Okay, so like the the space around the sun is curved, and this was one of the first predictions that general relativity made, and it was one of the first that was proven right because we analyzed the way that stars appeared to move in the sky during a solar eclipse. During a solar eclipse. We noticed that the stars directly behind the sun, you know, the day before the solar eclipse, we shouldn't have been able to see them. But when the solar eclipse happened, all of a sudden we could. And that's because light literally curves around massive objects. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing in these images is you're seeing a background galaxy, some galaxy far, far away. It's literally curving around the massive clusters and massive galaxies in front of it. Okay. And now what's important about that, and what's important about that in other image I showed you with the purple hue, is that one of the things we can calculate very easily, very readily from a gravitational lens is we can calculate based on how – what the angle is that the lens is, is, is um, perturbed through. You know, So essentially how far is the light lensed? How far is the light spread out? We can very readily calculate what the mass of the lensing object is. OK, so if if uh, we can calculate if it's um, the size of the Milky Way, we can calculate if it's larger than the Milky Way, we can calculate if it's less massive, et cetera. And what we calculate is that the mass of those galaxies, if we just take into account the stuff that is making light, you know, just the stars and that sort of stuff, then it comes nowhere close to the number we get when we analyze it from general relativity's perspective and calculate it from first principles by taking into account the lensing behavior. So there's a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy between the amount of mass that we can see with telescopes that is actually producing light and the amount of mass that we can infer by the fact that it causes this light to lens, to get to get you know spread out across the sky. These gravitational lenses are really cool in their own right. Yeah, and like you say, there's a lot you can learn from them then, right? Because like you say... Basically, you can learn the size of these things, and um, I've now, I mean, I've seen that image before of the lens in effect, but it's actually good to have it explained the way you're doing it here. Yeah, and so that 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 purpley hueish image I sent you is it's a is beautiful the, image, man. It's stunning. Yes, and so that's a galaxy cluster, and you can see inside of the purple, there's like these little striations, and those are background galaxies that are being lensed. Their light is being spread out. We wouldn't ordinarily be able to see them, but their light just happens to pass right near a massive object, and that massive object causes it to lens and to amplify so we can actually see those background galaxies. And by using the mass that we calculate from this procedure, we're able to estimate that dark matter takes – is the dark matter halo should be about that size. Now, I have a big problem with this. 
I just last week gave a talk on you know, calculating the mass of dark matter halos, how much dark matter is in a given galaxy. And the, the, the ways in which the community at large does it doesn't necessarily sit well with me. I do think, I agree with you a little bit, Kev, that it does seem to be a lot of like ad hoc hand-waving assumptions. There's a lot of that going on, okay? And that is because I think people are so eager, so eager to be the first person to put the nail in the coffin to say, man, I figured out what dark matter is. That's what it is. I figured it out. I got it. Give me the Nobel Prize. People are so eager to do that. You know, when you talk to Brian Keating, you get a, you get a feel for that. You understand how cutthroat science can be and how you just want to get the, the discovery. Did you read his book, Losing the Nobel Prize? Yes, I have. Yes. It was a very okay, um, so eye-opening experience, man. You, you get a sense for, you know, these people, these scientists, um, they're just like, you know, you, they're just like all your listeners. All they want to do is to be recognized for the work they put in. And the way they get recognized is they make discoveries. And so sometimes they're really eager. They're really eager to publish results, but sometimes those results are not up to par. And I think that's in some cases in the world of dark matter, you know, I agree with you ever so slightly. I agree that I'm not convinced that there is some massive halo that is somehow permeating all of the space around a galaxy and it's made up of some particles we can't detect. Would I be surprised if we were able to detect them and we were able to to finalize this idea and this theory? No. And I think wouldn't be about it as well, Brendan. I mean, we're having to say that this happens with not just one galaxy out there, but with every single galaxy you end up with just the right amount of these invisible particles just to hold everything together. And just to make the math work. <laughs> I mean, I added that bit on at the end there, but basically, you know, for that to happen, you know, all of these invisible particles randomly to end up there. I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense to me, dude. Oh, sorry, Kev. I accidentally cut my video off there. But um, yeah, no, I get it. I completely get it. I completely get it. I completely get the skepticism. I get it all. Um, it's and, not and so I much even, I... I wouldn't even say so much skepticism because like you say, Nobody really knows. And so, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I just, maybe the more standard answer you get, like from somebody at CERN, you, you know, that more kind of academic line taken, I just maybe, I'm more open-minded to what might be going on. That's that, I think that's safe to say where my position is. Yeah, I had um, Dr. Priya Natarajan on my show, and she is a superstar in the world of dark matter and, and dark energy. And, uh, you know, she is – I asked her point blank. I said, how convinced are you that there is actually you know, a, a cloud, a halo of p particles or something surrounding the galaxies, surrounding all of this stuff? And, and somehow it, it's out there and yet it's undetectable. And she said that um, – to paraphrase our conversation, you know, the initial observations weren't as convincing as when you started to see gravitational lenses. Because when you started to see gravitational lenses, you started to realize that that you know you could make first principles calculations completely based on Einstein's general theory of relativity. And Einstein's general theory of relativity has been proven right so many times in so many different avenues. And so we can put a little bit of trust in it. And when we can put trust in it, we can start to realize that galaxies are more massive than they appear to be. The question, though, is that are they more massive than they appear to be because there's some weird permeating invisible matter on the outskirts or for some other reason? And that's why we have to keep keep plugging along and keep answering these questions. And that's why we have to have people in the field – and I'm not in that field – but we have to have people in that field who are willing to stand up and say, wait a minute. Are you sure what you're doing is right? What, how about you consider it this way instead? And of course, talking of people's fields, you yourself – How's your work coming along, man? Still uh, trying to wade through the coding, stuff like that? Yes, I hate computers. <laughs> I hear that from a lot of my guests for varying reasons, but I can understand yours. Yeah, you know, I mean... Uh, we can. We have a few minutes. Yeah, Kev, just you want to jump into quantum gravity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, I forgot we were going to go there. So this is something I've been hearing about, and I've been looking at talks, presentations given by somebody called Leonard Susskind, 
Now, he talks very encouragingly and optimistically about how quantum gravity, and I kind of asked you to sum this up in a couple of minutes during the break, how you can do this, I do not know, but how that could really lead to a unified theory where we see the relativity and the quantum worlds coming together, you know, making them work together. Yeah, so one of the, the fundamental problems in all of physics, I would say, and I don't know if problem is the right word, because problem implies something's broken. Nothing's broken. Um, it's just, you know, two ideas, if you will, that don't seem to want to mesh. And the two ideas are general relativity, which describes the most massive objects in the universe, and on the other hand, quantum mechanics, which describes the smallest objects in the universe. So how can we create a cohesive picture that takes into account general relativity and quantum quantum mechanics. And the unification of those two is called quantum gravity. Now, where we expect quantum gravitational effects to be important, there's not many places in the universe where you're going to have very massive objects and yet have the subatomic structure be very important. But there is one, and it's black holes. If we want to understand, Kev, what not just like, you know, that picture of a black hole is really pretty, but it's still leaves the question, begs the question, if you will, what is inside the black hole? It's great to see it. It's wonderful. You know, it blows my mind every time I see it. I can look at it right now and it blow my mind again. Um, but what's inside? That's the fundamental question. That's the most interesting question to me in all of physics. What is going on inside of a black hole? And if we intend to answer that, then we have to know a little bit about quantum gravity. Because even though inside of that region is so massive, contains so much mass, so much information, okay? We need to understand it on a very small scale because at the very, very center of that black hole is a very tiny region, what many have called the singularity. Is it a singularity? I don't know. I'm not convinced it is. I don't like the idea that, that there's a such thing as a singularity in, in the universe. You know, I don't like the idea that you could somehow go to infinity at the center of a black hole. And Ray Weiss talks about this a little bit with me last week on, the, on my show, is that he doesn't like that idea either. Doesn't even, and so, you know, it's hard to really compute how things of so much mass can be condensed down into something that basically occupies no space. Right. And so if we want to understand that process from a fundamental point of view, we need to understand what goes on in that small space. Is it a singularity? I argue, you know, and, and argue is a bad word there. I surmise, okay, because it really is just a guess. It's a guess. I guess that it's not a singularity. You know, my brain, for whatever reason, may, dogma maybe, I don't know, doesn't want me to believe that it's a singularity. There. Are you a wormhole so, kind of guy? I'm not a wormhole kind of guy. I'm a oh, blown away kind of guy. I'm just a, you know, like, man, I don't know. I do, I think, what all people do. And I paint this picture where I try to avoid as much nihilism as possible. And I think a singularity at the center of a black hole would be rather nihilistic because it would be saying, there's a singularity. We can never understand it. No matter how much science we do, that thing is off limits. Give up, you know? Whereas if we attack it from the quantum perspective, then we could say, there's something interesting going on at the center of that black hole. If we only can come up with a theory of quantum gravity, then we can learn how to explain that subatomic region. And then perhaps maybe through some yet an unknown force, we've got entanglement with another black hole in the center of another galaxy somewhere. And perhaps, you know, maybe we can communicate like you were kind of maybe hinting at before the break. Yes, there's some, you know, as we talked about, there's some scribblings on a chalkboard somewhere that say that we can. Whether or not we can, <laughs> in actuality, in the complexity of the real universe, that is yet to be determined. Brendan, thank you for your time. Love geeking out with you, man, and you're going to be on, become a, one of the superstars in science. You really are. You're a superstar already to my, myself and the audience out there. Please check out Brendan's work over at thestateoftheuniverse.com. I'll be back tomorrow, so until then, wherever you are, make it TFR and don't go falling into any black holes.